a beep on the machine. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. Uh, as Carmen said, I can speak very quickly. Uh, if I start speaking too quickly, just put your hand up like this and let me know that I'm going too quickly, okay? Because I do that. My own students ask me to do slow down as well. So what I'm talking about is a, is a monetary and what I call complex systems approach to macroeconomics, which is not what the mainstream of economics does, which fundamentally is non-monetary and tries to treat the economy um, as, a, generally speaking, a linear system, not a complex one. I'll, I'll talk about the difference here. And then, of course, the economic crisis of 2008 hit the Western, Western world, America, of course, in particular. It's still clearly affecting Europe. Um, and it was completely unanticipated by the models that mainstream economists work in. Uh, they, you call their models DSGE for Dynamic Stochastic General Equilibrium. Are you familiar with those models to some extent? Some? Not some. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Um, and those models, when they were used to forecast in 2007, forecast forward, they literally were described as predicting a benign experience for the global economy in 2008. That's, that's a, that word was used by the OECD to describe its forecasts. It was used by the Federal Reserve to describe its forecasts in late 2007, early 2008, after we now know the crisis had already begun. Now, after the crisis, their defences largely had three... They had to defend themselves from the public, saying, why did you not see this coming? The most famous instance of that happening was the Queen of England saying to economists, why did nobody see this coming? Okay. Now, the defences were, first of all, to say, well, you can't predict a crisis. It can't be seen coming. It's a large random event. You can't predict a large random event, just like you can't predict that you're going to get you know, a, a, a royal flush when you're playing poker. It's unpredictable. Second is to say that well, maybe what the work area that I work in, which are called nonlinear models, maybe they could have done it, but they're just too complicated. You can't really build a meaningful model. It's just too complex. You have to simplify. And the third one is that even though the models they use, which are generally described as linear models, and by linear models it means that you can separate each of the factors that affect the system from each other, and if you double the value of one of those parameters or one of those variables, you double the impact it has. You don't make it eight times as big or one quarter as big when you double its scale. It's, uh, the, the, the change in the variable scales to the change it makes to the whole system. And this is a quote from um, Olivia Blanchard, who is, I think, you're now the uh, chief economist for the uh, IMF. I, I keep on confusing the IMF or World Bank, but the IMF. World Bank, because in IMF is Christine Lagarde. Uh, chief economist, not yeah. and not chief, um, not chief operator. Op 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 okay, okay. And he said that maybe these models are okay if we can keep the global economy away from what he called dark corners, where strange things happen. <coughs> the models don't apply. Well, my response to each of those is: first of all, the model was the, the crisis couldn't be predicted because they left out one of the most important variables in the economy. When you include that variable, the crisis is completely predictable. And plenty of people were warning that they saw one coming because they were looking at this indicator, which economists said they didn't have to consider. So it was a mistake in the prior beliefs of economists that meant that important variable wasn't part of their models. Secondly, it's true you can build... To, to build a complete model of the global economy, you'd need to have an incredibly complicated model. But you can get very deep insights out of simple models, which nonetheless have what are called complex behaviours to them. And the third one is, we're still in that dark corner. Okay? The dark corner they think we should stay away from, the global economy is still there. But they can't identify it because that dark corner is based upon the variable they leave out of their models. So going through some of the reasons they, they did not consider the important factors in the economy, their first false prior false belief they have before they analyse the data, which therefore means they leave out this factor when they do analyse the data, is the role of money in the economy. Now, talking to non-economists, they're simply 
They don't believe me when I tell them that economists don't include money in their models because their attitude is economists are experts on the economy, the economy is monetary, therefore economists should be experts on money. But fundamentally, economists teach themselves that money only causes nominal changes, it doesn't ch cause changes to the real economy, the physical economy, and that's all they worry about. So they've rationalised leaving it out. And it's built the argument that money doesn't matter or money only affects nominal values as opposed to real values is built right into the heart of mainstream theory, right back in the microeconomics level where students are taught what are called was called the money illusion. And this is the idea that if you believe that changing monetary variables affects real decisions, then we show you a little illustration showing a budget line with your utility functions. We double all prices and double incomes. You reach the same outcome. If you don't believe that, you suffer from money illusion. Therefore, you are irrational. Okay? But we believe people are rational. Therefore, they don't suffer from money illusion. Therefore, this is a fallacy. And therefore, you can ignore money. That's the logic which is built into micro. Now, for many, time, many decades, that micro vision wasn't part of macroeconomics. But with the revision of macroeconomics to make it consistent with microeconomic theory as well consistent as neoclassical economists believed it could be and was this micro concept became embedded in macroeconomics as well so if you go back to the original paper that Lucas used to critique the previous uh, empirical models that dominated the large-scale uh, numerical modeling of the economy after the Second World War till about 1975, Lucas stated that it's natural to see the cyclical variations that we see as having a, being caused by a fairly stable supply curve with a very volatile demand curve moving up and down that demand curve. But then he said there's a paradox because the absence of money illusion okay, implies that the supply curve should be vertical, okay, in which case monetary disturbances should simply change the price level without changing the real level of output, without changing employment, output levels, etc., etc. So this micro theory says there should be no consequence for monetary variables on the real economy. Now they've made it more elaborate than that, but that's the fundamental belief. The second false prior is that just as they can ignore money, they can also ignore debt, private debt. And this comes down to the argument that you can describe the monetary system using a model called loanable funds. And loanable funds again uses this idea of interact intersecting supply and demand curves to have a supply curve for the amount of money that's available to be lent depending upon the interest rate. So the higher the interest rate, the higher the level of money that people are willing to lend. And then a demand curve which comes out of investment where the higher the interest rate, the lower the demand and the equilibrium of the two gives you an equilibrium rate given a particular level of employment. This argument says that what's going on with um, uh, increasing levels of debt is simply a transfer of some of those loanable funds from some lenders to other borrowers. And the higher the equilibrium point, the more uh, is going to be uh, lent. But it really doesn't affect the level of real output all that much because when you have lending, all you're doing is transferring spending power from one person to another. So you're changing who does the spending. You're not really changing the level all that much unless there are enormous differences between the lenders and the borrowers in terms of their behaviour as consumers. So this is from... Uh, this quote comes from Ben Bernanke in his book called Essays on the Great Depression. And in that essay, he considered the arguments made by Irving Fisher back in the 1930s, saying that the crisis, the de Great de Depression, was caused by a debt deflationary crisis. Too much debt, falling prices, that was a major factor in Fisher's explanation. Now, largely speaking, Bernanke dismissed this argument. He came up with a slight twist that made it consistent with conventional theory. But he said, as you can see here, Fisher's idea was less influential in academic circles because of the counter-argument that debt deflation represented no more than a redistribution from one group, debtors, to another group, creditors. And absent implausibly large differences between the two groups, pure redistribution should have no significant macroeconomic effects. So it's saying, therefore, as well as ignoring money, you can also ignore private debt. Now, that argument 
is maintained even after the crisis we've just been through, where even people who support that argument accept that private debt played a role in the crisis, but they see it as a transitory role. And this, the essence of this opposition is, again, that same model of money, the loanable funds model I mentioned a moment ago. And this is quoting from Paul Krugman now from his book End This Depression Now. And he says that when debt is rising, it's not the economy as a whole borrowing more money. So there's no change in the amount of money given a change in the amount of debt. That's the important proposition there. He said it's rather a case of less patient people people who want to spend sooner rather than later, borrowing from more patient people. And again, that same idea, transfer spending power, no real impact upon the level of demand. So you have a, a fall in the spending power of the lender is off create, offset by an increase in the spending power of the, the borrower, and then when the repayment occurs, the same thing occurs. So the, re, the borrower repays part of the debt, the borrower's spending power goes down, the lender's spending power goes up. Overall, there's not a large impact. And he uses this proposition to critique Richard Kuhl. Now, Richard Kuhl is one of a, a number of analysts whose arguments I largely agree with about what caused not just our crisis, but also the crisis in Japan back in 1990. And he's, this is Krugman critiquing Kuhl here, saying, Kuhl envisages as an economy in which everyone is balance sheet constrained, as opposed to one where there's some who are and some who aren't. And he says, this makes no sense. He says that when there are debtors, there must be creditors. So if somebody's if debtors obviously can't spend, then creditors can spend in their place. Okay? So he can't see a way in which an entire economy can be balance sheet constrained. And it's coming from the point of view of this loanable funds model of lending. So what I want to indicate is to show that you can actually understand this perspective by modelling loanable funds in a dynamic modelling system. But I built a software package called Minsky, which if you wanted to have a look at it yourself, is available from this website, which is the SourceForge repository of open source software. And you can download it by clicking on that button or you can download a version for Apple or Linux from there. So I've designed the software package so that I can actually model monetary flows easily. And the lending model that Krugman has with his collaborator Eckertson in the Quarterly Journal of Economics is that there's a patient consumer, producing, consumer goods producing agent who lends to an impatient investment goods producing agent. And then they have all the usual new, so-called new Keynesian assumptions there. Um, what happens is the investment agent has borrowed from the consuming agent, so the investment agent has to pay interest to the consuming agent. And the bank plays no role apart from being intermediary. So the bank arranges the loan and therefore charges the consumer agent a fee for arranging the loan. But that's the only role they do. But what I've done in this model is take that fundamental concept of loanable funds and that I've injected into what I see as a more realistic model of capitalism where I have not an investing agent and a consuming agent but an investment sector and a consuming goods sector both of you have to hire workers to produce output, who buy output from each other so they can produce what they need to produce. It's like a heavy industry and light industry classification. So heavy industry needs light industry output to produce heavy industry goods. Light industry needs heavy industry to produce light industry goods. So they've input-output dynamics are necessary. They sell their outputs both to workers and to the banks, and they also can consume from their own profits, of course. Uh, the investment agent... Uh, has, can change the rate at which the, the investment sector can change the rate at which it borrows and change the rate at which it repays. And then we'll see the impact of those changes on both the level of economic activity, the level of debt and so on, and look at it and say, well, what actually happens? Does debt matter in this model? And the answer is no, it doesn't. The model, if the model of loanable funds accurately describe the real world, then the neoclassical economist would be right to ignore the level of private debt and money. And I'll show you that in a simulation. So this is the basic model here. I've got a, the bank arranges a loan, uh, charges demediation fee, workers are hired, etc., etc. And the way it's set up in Minsky is using double entry bookkeeping. Is anybody doing accounting here? Any accounting students? Or have you done accounting in your past? Okay, maybe some of the staff, okay. But what's going on here is double entry bookkeeping. And the basic sum in accounting is that assets minus liability equals equity. 
So I've got all three classifications here. And for each uh, entity in the system, the assets are shown as a positive amount. Notice the reserves are positive here. And the liabilities and equity are shown as negative. So each row sums to zero. And then a, a flow, a transaction from one group to the other, goes from positive to negative. So that's why the signs might look strange to you, but you'll see why it makes sense when I take a look at the same activity from the point of view of uh, the consuming sector later. So lending is that action. This is the invest the consumer goods sector CD. I'll just go backwards if I can. Let's see. This is the deposit. This is showing the reserves in the banking sector. This is the in deposit account of the investment sector, deposit account of the consumer sector, the workers' deposit account, and the bank's equity. And lending involves a transfer from the consumer goods bank account to the investment goods bank account. Okay. Now notice there's no mention of debt in that table. The reason is debt is an asset of the consumer sector. It's neither an asset nor a liability of the banking sector, so it doesn't turn up in the model. You have to see what the consumer sector's uh, table looks like here. And now debt is shown there as an asset. Now when you see lending in this case, Notice the consumer deposit uh, account is shown as an asset of the consumer sector, so it's shown as a positive amount. Negative from the point of view of the bank, positive from the point of view of the uh, consumer agent itself. So lending involves taking money out of here and transferring it there. So now lending goes from here across to here. Okay? So that's why it's sensible to show it as a negative sum in the, in the bank's account. And of course, having increased the amount of, you, to lend, you've got to decrease the money you've got in your own account, but it increases an, another asset which earns you an income, which is why the consumer sector is doing it. It has to do with, of course, having done that, you've got to do without the money in the meantime. And once I've put the whole thing together, has anybody here seen, seen a system dynamics program before? Have you heard of system dynamics? Okay. It's going to look strange, okay? What it is, is a flow chart, where the flow chart can be edited and you place objects on the on the screen. You can see I can move physically move the location of something around here. Um, these are equations. So this is the amount of debt multiplied by a, a time lag in replaying it is the rate of repayment. And you actually see it in equations. Notice this tab here. If you come over to the tab, you can see all the mathematical equations that have been designed by the system here. But it's actually written, just go down the bottom there. So it's moderately complex, complicated, not complex model. Come over here, all those equations are generated by the flow charts you see there. Now, once I've got this set up, the banking sector I showed you a moment ago, that table in, uh, shown in PowerPoint, this is actually live in the program. So you can see all the amounts I showed you beforehand are reproduced here. And this is the consumer sector's table where I've got the consumer sector having debt as an asset. So it's exactly what I've shown you in the simulation beforehand. And if I vary the numbers over here, I change the rate of lending and I change the rate of repayment. And I want you to look at the growth rate here uh, as I do that. So let's start running the model. And what I've got now is the growth rate of the economy starts negative and then stabilises at roughly zero. And notice, I'll just actually, what I might just do is, because of the scale of the screen here, I'll just drag this up a bit so you can see also the level of demand and level of the money stock down here. Notice as, as the lending continues, there's no change in the money stock. That's the, the red line. But the level of debt is rising. And it'll reach a, a stable level at some point. Now, if I speed up lending and also make lend repayments occur much more slowly, you'll notice the level of debt's rising dramatically now. Okay. Now, there's been a little dip in the growth rate, but very little impact on the growth rate of the economy. I'll let that go on for a while. And you can see now debt exceeds the level of money in the economy, which can happen. And now if I dramatically slow down lending and dramatically speed up repayment, so you have people trying to repay their debt much more rapidly than they did beforehand, the level of debt in the economy plunges. Notice growth rate actually rose in that period, 
So there's been a boom and a slump in the level of lending in the economy. I'll put it back to the original levels now. So it'll stabilise again. Let's just now take a look at what has happened. And that's what, on the PowerPoint screen over here, I've graphed the, the whole thing for you. And notice that the growth rates barely changed through a large number of alterations I made like that to the parameters in the system. Huge rise in debt, huge fall in debt again. The debt to GDP ratio rising quite dramatically. Here's GDP. Now that simulation ran for a, a, some, something close to a 200 years of effective time in simulating it. GDP was roughly constant all the way through. So from this point of view, debt doesn't make a big difference to the economy. And that's the argument that the neoclassicals make, that it's unimportant. Why is it unimportant? Well, I now want you to consider a, a logical framework now and say, how could it be that borrowing money has no impact upon the level of economic activity? And what we're going to show you is an expenditure table. So the table shows spending by one of three, three sectors in each row, and then money in and out, net income, for each sector by each column. And the capital letters will indicate spending which is financed without borrowing money, whereas lowercase will indicate spending that is financed by borrowing money. And I'm going to look at three situations. One is where you can't borrow at all. So all your spending is just financed by your own money. The second, where you can borrow from another sector, and that's effectively loanable funds. And the third, when you can borrow from a bank. And when you borrow from a bank, and this is the Bank of England has been saying this quite loudly now for the last year and a half, and the group of economists that I come from have been saying it for 40, 60, 120 years, really, when you go back far enough. We say that when a bank lends you money, it doesn't transfer money from one asset of its own to another. It creates an asset in the loan, and it creates a liability at the same time. Assets and liabilities both rise, both go up. Okay? Nobody has to lose any spending power for a bank to lend money. But I'll show you the first situation first of all, and that's where there's no borrowing or lending that's possible. So when you put this table together, you get net income for each of the three sectors shown here, expenditure across the, across the row. So this is showing the sector A spending is A plus B, and it uh, reduces the money that sector one has, but of course it increases the money that sectors two and three have. And the same here for sector two, and the same for sector three. As you can see, each row necessarily sums to zero. Each column can be non-zero because C plus E can be larger than A plus B, so to give me positive net income for sector one, but it's got to be negative for one of the others. So if you look at the mathematics here, what you've got across the diagonal is what we call aggregate demand. Total demand in the economy is going to be the sum of those three cells. So that's aggregate expenditure. Now aggregate income is necessarily the off-diagonal elements. So looking at it from the point of view of aggregate income, it's going to be the same sum. Okay? But you work out it's different cells in that matrix that gives you that data. So clearly expenditure is identical to income. It's not that it's equal, it's identical. Okay. So if I work out, if I add up the, the, the diagonals, I get those three terms. If I add up the off diagonals, I get those six terms. Obviously they're the same as each other. Now I'm going to look at loanable funds. This is where you can borrow an amount, I'm going to call it A plus B. From sec sector one can borrow A plus B from sector two. And that means sector one's funds for spending increase by a little A plus little B and sector two's funds fall by exactly the same amount. Now, I could make them, I'm going to make them the same in this case, that one spends less, exactly the amount they borrow from one they, they spend on um, one of the same sectors. Of course, it doesn't have to be that. It's just to make the, the notation easier to read. But here I have, with the extra A plus B, sector one spends A plus little a on sector two, and, sector, and spends B plus little b on sector three, and I've got sector two spending C minus A here and D minus B there. Now of course do the same mathematics. What do you find is of course that you get A plus B cancels with A plus B here. No no change. It's exactly the same argument. Expenditure equals income. But now I'm going to look at lending by a bank. What happens when you borrow money from a bank? Well the bank's assets rise by the loan and its liabilities rise by the deposit the assets aren't part of what circulates in the economy, the liabilities are. 
So what you get is an increase in spending power by sector one when it borrows from a bank, which is not offset by a fall in spending power by sector two. So if I put this together, I'm ignoring at this stage payment of interest and so on. I'll take this into account in a moment. I have the A plus B here, but no offsetting minus A and minus B here. So when you look what aggregate demand is, it includes the A plus B. Look at aggregate expenditure, it includes the A plus B. So the borrowing money from a bank increases spending and increases income. Both aggregate demand and aggregate income rise by the same amount. So they're larger if there's borrowing from a bank. What's going on, an increase in debt when you borrow from a bank causes an equivalent increase in both expenditure and income. Now, if I modify that, I can modify um, the model that I've shown you a moment ago, and I'll do it live, to go from the loanable funds vision where the bank does not lend the money to endogenous money where the bank does lend the money. So I'm going to delete that column and make that an asset at the bank instead. So let's just take a look at that. I'll go back to this model here, reset it back to zero. This is the consumer goods sector column. If I click here, I can delete that column. If I click over here in the minus signs, I can delete the operation shown here. So I'm going to delete lending, delete debt repayment, delete interest payments, delete a bank fee. I need to make a couple of other changes to make it exactly accurate. I need to reduce the, um, the value of the equity of the, um, of the bank, of the consumer sector from 70 to 60 there. There's but that's got rid of, the debt is no longer shown as an asset of the consumer sector. If I go over to the bank, I can add an additional column and say what, what assets haven't been allocated. Well, because the debt is still a liability of the investment sector, it still exists in the system. So if I click on here, I bring the debt down and notice, you'll notice the operations for lending and repayment automatically are brought down by the program. It interlocks the various balance sheets in the system. And all I need to do now is say, well, that interest payment is actually made to the bank. So that makes that correct. Again, I've got to make a couple of little changes over here. I have to now show the bank's equity is now 15. So that row sums to zero. And I might as well delete this bank fee, which is a fiction. So that's all I had to do to change from one model to the other. What's the impact of doing that? Let's go back to zero scale again reset it so the program gets the new equations ready. Notice the growth rate is positive. The economy is growing. I'll just stop it for a second and just let you move it up a bit so you can see the debt and money stock now. Notice the money stock is also growing. So increasing the amount of debt is increasing money in the economy. If I now speed up lending, we have a boom. I'll just actually, again, just to make it possible to see the whole thing, I'll drag this down a bit so you can see the growth rate has risen there. And notice money stock has also risen. Ah, pardon me, the program graphics aren't all that fast, so I'll just see if I can drag it down so you can see those two controls there. Not quite. Pardon me taking some time doing this. Okay, now if I run it and I increase the speed of lending, you can see the boom, the economy is booming. Oh, pardon me, it's still not quite right there. So I like high resolution screens. I can show the whole thing in at one, one go rather than needing to move things around. Let's now so also have repayment taking much longer. So. Notice the level of money is growing in the economy. The growth rate's gone through the roof. The economy is booming. If I now have the banks lend more slowly, and I have repayment happening much more quickly, the economy goes into a slump. If I now restore the original situation for lending and repayment, we're back to a normal growth rate level again. So all I've done is make those simple structural changes to the model. And suddenly I've got a very, very different vision of the role of money in the economy. So simulating it, you can find that changing the level of debt in the economy causes a boom, 
when there's rising level of debt, decline in earning money causes a slump. That's how important it is to include the banking sector in your models of macroeconomics, and it's why the neoclassicals didn't see the system coming. Now, this is just to show that there's some mathematics behind this because a lot of neoclassical economists, the, the mainstream, believe that anybody criticises them just doesn't understand the mathematics. I'm now working with people who have PhDs in quantum mechanics. You don't tell them they don't understand mathematics. It's just to show that, you know, uh, this is this, this fairly simple mathematics as far as quantum mechanics goes, but that's, these are the sets of equations that describe the financial flows. And the, there are quite minor differences when you look at them. All that's happened is that these three terms, repayment and lending and the fee, have disappeared from the consumer deposits account, because they're a fiction. And the interest payment has moved uh, from going to the consumer sector to going to the banking sector. So it's quite small structural changes in the model, but that gives you a very, very different vision of how capitalism functions. And it's the vision that's accurate to the system we're in. So the reason they missed it was by leaving out this incredibly important system part of the economy. Now, what I showed you beforehand was very stylized. This is a more complicated expenditure matrix. And what's going on here is I'm now treating these S1, S2, S3 as actual amounts of money in a bank account. I've now got bank equity here as well. And this is expenditure out of existing money, given a rate of time flow for that expenditure, plus the change in debt. So those are the bank accounts. You now get the change in debt turning up as an argument in the expenditure of the sector that's borrowing and the incomes of the sectors in which that money is being spent. And you get interest payments turning up as well. And it's also interest rate payments on deposits as well as payment on loans. So when I put the whole thing together, I get a much more complicated expression for what's going on with expenditure. And it comes down to having three elements. The first is that expenditure and income include turnover of existing money plus gross financial transactions, not net, gross. So interest on loans and interest on deposits both turn up as part of aggregate demand and aggregate income and also the change in debt. That's the most important variable. So when you generalise like that, what you find is that aggregate demand and aggregate uh, income, uh, aggregate demand, in income and demand expand, uh, financed by non-debt-based expenditure, so existing money, plus the change in debt, plus gross financial transactions. And what you get is a dynamic and non-equilibrium version of what Milton Friedman called the quantity theory of money. Because Milton Friedman's equation basically said that the prices times real output will be equal to the velocity of money times the amount of money in the economy. Now I'm saying when you look at the endogenous money, you add in the change in debt as a fundamental part of your equation. So that's a dynamic and it's also clearly non-equilibrium version of the quantity theory of money. And when you look at the rate of change of the monetary system, it includes both change in debt and the acceleration of debt. If change in debt is an argument into a, a, aggregate demand and income, then acceleration of debt is part of the change in aggregate demand and income, which gives us change in GDP. So you have to have a monetary vision of capitalism. And the reason that the mainstream missed the crisis was they left out the monetary system out of their models. Well, of course you can't predict a crisis caused by the monetary system using models that don't have the monetary system in it and that don't treat money as being generated by what banks do. So that's why they didn't see the crisis coming. It wasn't because it couldn't be predicted. It's because they left out the indicators that told everybody else who looked at them that a crisis was likely. So they, they exclude the most important variables, the rate of change and the acceleration of private debt. And when I... Um, look at that, you, you have this vision that change in debt is just a minor redistributive thing. The true logic is that the same equality of expenditure and income applies with those three elements to it. So if you have a slowdown in the rate of growth of debt, that itself can cause a recession. And when you have a, a steeper slowdown in the change of debt when it goes negative, which happened during this crisis, and that was the first time it had happened since the Second World War, then you have a depression. And that's what we've been through, and that's what Europe is still experiencing. So if you looked at the data, as I did before the crisis occurred, it was obvious that the level of debt was just too high. Its rate of 
growth was too high. At some point they had to turn around. And the same argument was made by Wynne Godley using a different, uh, different uh, form of analysis. So we both were saying private debt had to slow down. When it slowed down, there would be the beginnings of a crisis. If it went negative, there would be a depression-level crisis. So that's why it was predictable. So when you take a look at the data, you can see this writ large in American economic history, not just for the last 20 years, but for the last 150 years. This is going actually almost 200 years. This is data I've managed to put together using a set of time series, overlapping time series, showing the level of private debt going back to 1834 in America and the level of government debt going back, actually back to 1790. And what you can see is that there's been this incredible growth in debt over time. And we are now living at a period of, when you normalise for current data versus earlier data, the highest level of debt in the history of capitalism. That's why this is such a unique crisis. Now, Wynne Godley began warning of the crisis back in 1998, using arguments about sectoral balances, and I'll talk about that a bit in a moment. I started you talk, re warning about it in 2006, using my arguments about the dynamics of private debt. So that's why it was predictable well before the crisis using a monetary analysis of capitalism. Without a monetary analysis, you couldn't see it coming. So what you then found was the crisis occurs when the rate of growth of debt slows down. And this is using annual data from 1920 to 1940. That's debt change. This is the unemployment rate. Now, again, according to the mainstream, there should be no correlation between the two, okay, because there's no causal link. Well, the correlation is minus 0.78, and I've shown you the causal link. When you take a look at our current data, to me it's simply... I'm flabbergasted by that correlation. The correlation between change in debt and unemployment between 1990 and today in America is minus 0.93. Now, that's not even putting it into a full econometric model. It's a single variable correlation of that scale. It's not a correlation argument. It's a causal argument for which I'm showing correlation data to support the argument. The, again, I've mentioned the acceleration of that is an important element of the change in demand. Well, then, when you take a look at the change in, de, de, in acceleration of debt, or the, the acceleration of debt and the change in unemployment, that's the correlation you get again for the last 20 years in America. Now, again, you can see the severity of deceleration of debt during the crisis and the increase in unemployment. And again, a ludicrous correlation, working in terms of economic data, minus 0.88. It's, it's just you know, beyond belief that you get a level that high. So we have to model the economy in both monetary terms and with debt as an essential part of the argument and out of equilibrium. And the, the error that the mainstream has made is modelling it as an equilibrium system without money or debt. So the second defence, and I might have to check my time and see I'm going on time here. How much time do I have to finish, do you think? Fifteen minutes, maximum. Fifteen minutes, okay. Well, I'll just go through. Okay, I'll go through the second part. That is, I'm going to show you a simple cyclical model of the economy developed by Richard Goodwin back in 1967. And it's very, very simple and very stylized. This is the reason about a simple model can give you complex behavior. So you said, well, the le level of cap, roughly speaking, your output depends on how many factories you have. Level of capital determines your level of output. Level of output determines employment. How much you want to produce tells you how many workers you need to hire. The employment level you've got, given your population, gives you an employment rate. And again, generally speaking, level of empl employment rate will give you some idea of the rate of change of wages. Wages determine profits. In this simple model, there's only two social classes, capitalists and workers. So output minus wages equals profit. Goodman had a simple model where all profits were invested. And investment is the rate of change of capital. Now, that's the complete model. Putting it in equations, you have capital divided by the accelerator relationship gives you output. Output divided by labour productivity gives you labour. Labour divided by population gives you the employment rate. I fit that into a linear Phillips curve, very simple Phillips curve relationship. The Phillips curve times the current wage rate is the rate of change of wages. Wages determine prop, uh, wages times labour gives you the wage bill. Output minus wages is profit. In this simple model, all profit is invested. 
and investment minus depreciation is the rate of change of capital stock, and you're back to the capital again. Now, you put that together into a system, and I've got a few simple parameter values here, and initial conditions, which are needed, and I get a model that gives you cycles. So this is the other side of Minsky. I haven't shown you this so far. You can build what's called a system dynamics model where here's the rate of change of capital stock divided by the accelerator is output, divided by labour productivity is employment, divided by population is the employment rate. There's the Phillips curve, times the wage rate gives you the level of wages, wages minus output is profit, is invested, back to capital stock again. What does that give you system behaviour? Economists normally expect equilibrium to apply, instead you get permanent cycles like that. Okay. So that was Goodwin's model in 1967. Now all I added to it was a bit of realism. And that is that, first of all, capitalists don't invest all their profits. Okay. They invest more during a boom and less during a slump. And I used the linear investment function just to illustrate that, a very simple investment function. So I'm now saying there's a profit rate, and investment depends upon the profit rate, and if it, receives, it exceeds an equilibrium level, they'll invest more. If it's less than that equilibrium level, they invest less. And uh, I then ignore where they get the money from, not looking at where they have, where they, how they finance it yet, and where they store any surplus. So putting that into the system, what happens? Well, the answer is not a lot, because I'm still working with a two-dimensional model. I've only got, uh, effectively, the capital stock and wages in this model. And there's a technical reason for this. The two-dimensional model can only have three actual states of behaviour, but I get the same sort of cyclical behaviour as before. Now, what I haven't included yet is that when they, capitalists want to borrow, invest more than they earn in profits, they have to borrow money. So they borrow from a bank. And when they, the bank, of course, charges interest on the outstanding debt. So what happens when I add those equations? Well, I now have profit is now net not just of wages, but also interest payments on existing debt. And the rate of change of debt is investment minus profits. And just use a couple of, you know, the 5% rate of interest, add some graphs, simulate this model, and now let's look at that. Let's make it a bit smaller so you can see the four graphs here. And it's actually a bit smaller again so you can see the equations down here. So all I've added is uh, investment minus profits is the rate of change of debt multiplied by the interest rate. You get interest payments, subtract that over here. That's all I've added to the system. So if I now simulate this, I get a model that starts off with a set of cycles. Now, you might, note, you might expect the cycles to reach equilibrium. Well, they start tending towards it, and they move away because the equilibrium is actually unstable. And finally, you get a breakdown. The economy collapses. So what you're getting there is the now a third dimension. And the third dimension is the level of debt. And this is what introduces complex behaviour. There's a very important uh, theoretical paper called Period 3 Implies Chaos by Lyon York, I think back in the 90s, late early 1970s, I think. And what we've now gone is from a simple system to a complex system. But it's a simple, complex system. But it still tells us a lot about capitalism. For a start, notice there is a period of decreasing volatility at the beginning of the simulation. Then there was rising volatility. And finally, there was a breakdown. Throughout the whole thing, the ratio of private debt to GDP was rising. And the workers' share of output was falling increasing inequality. So all those things, debt, inequality and crisis, are part of this model. And what were the determining features of the last 20 years? Debt, inequality and crisis. So a very simple model can give you very deep insights into a capitalist system. And that's without bringing in nonlinear functions or growth even in that particular model. So there's three truisms that summarise this model. And again, this is one of the strengths of dynamic modelling as opposed to the static stuff neoclassicals do where they force all sorts of assumptions to cancel terms, you know, imposing price equals marginal cost to get rid of some elements of their DSG models and so on. But those three equations that determine the system can be described verbally. The employment rate will rise if economic growth exceeds the sum of population growth and labour productivity growth. That's a fact. It's simply a statement of a stylized, a real, a real fact. If the wages share of output will rise if wage demands exceed the rate of growth of labour productivity, that's another fact. 
And finally, the private debt to GDP ratio will rise if the rate of growth of private debt exceeds the rate of economic growth. That's another fact. But you put those three facts together and you get that complex system. And its interactions map what happened in the real world. And if I simulate uh, the model, that's the sort of behaviour I get with nonlinear functions, with the vertical axis showing the debt ratio, wages share and employment here. When you look at the American data, of course it's far more complicated, but the same basic dynamic is occurring cycles with rising level of private debt to GDP leading to a breakdown. So you can capture an enormous amount of what's going on uh, with a simple complex system. And I might leave it at that graphic to leave time for questions. Thank you. So thank you very